At 14, you're thinking about taking your life. Yeah. And then the chef, after lunch, he called me over and says, you know, you should go back home to your mother. You're too young to do that. You're too little. Your mother should breastfeed you for another year. And maybe you grow up like he was crazy. And then he said, OK, you're out. You're gone. You know, we fire you. And it was probably one of my worst days. And I went on the bridge where the train goes over. So it was a high bridge. And I said, I'm going to kill myself. I'm going to jump into the water. And I'm not going home for sure. <laughs> It's very rare when you find somebody in the restaurant world, as a chef, you know, there's a lot of uh, chefs out there who are very creative, but it's tough for them to make that transition from being a chef who do very well in the kitchen to go and open up a restaurant that lasts for 36 years, for as long as his has, and then become an entrepreneur and become one of the top five wealthiest chefs around the world, one and only Wolfgang Puck. Sir, thank you for your time. Thank you for having me. It's yes, a, good indeed a pleasure. Wealthiest, I don't know. <laughs> I saw you on a list. It said top five. I said, you know what? Because I, I saw one time you said when you were a chef back in France and yeah. you said you would watch these people in America use the word Chevrolet and Cadillac. Yeah. And you said, I want to be rich one day. And then, you know, you come to America and you have your story. So and now I drive a Cadillac. See? You really come to <laughs> and Escalade. Yeah. Probably Escalade. Yeah. Okay, that's cool. So what I'd want to do is before we go into what you've done, obviously Spago, if you're in LA, I think in LA there's three two-star Michelin two-stars, yeah. right? Yours is one of them Spago. 2012 well, when you were awarded yeah. before they, you did your renovation. And yeah. If you're in LA, everybody wants to go to Spago. This is like a main spot. It's so. an institution. Spago has become a worldwide institution. People know it. If you go to England or Australia, yeah. or you know about Spago. So before we get into Spago, Cut, Wolfgang Puck, The yeah. Express, some of the things they've been doing with HSN, let's go back and kind of uh, hear the story of how you got started. You know, like if I wasn't, say I was in high school with you, we're 16 years old, you and I are good friends, we're classmates. Who was Wolfgang Puck? Well, Wolfgang Puck never went to high school. He never so, went to high school. Never went to high school. I started out, my mother was a professional chef too in the summertime. So when I was 12, 13 years old, I always spent the summer, the vacation with my mother at this resort hotel. I remember she had a small room, the hotel provided the lodging, and then she had them build a bunk bed. So I slept up on top and she had a bed underneath. And, my stepfather was working in the mines and everything. So I spent there and spent time cooking and uh, helping the pastry chef, helping my mom a little bit. And then when I was 14, I left school. Fully? 14, yeah. Left school? Fully, totally. Your mom was okay with that? Well, she had no choice. And because I just said, this is what it's gonna be. I started to cook professionally to an apprenticeship in Villach in Austria. I worked there for three years. Then I moved to France, stayed seven years in France, and then I moved to the United States, first to Indianapolis a year, and then I came here to Los Angeles, and I'm here since 1975. What was your personality like at 14? Like, if we're friends, what, what was Wolfgang Puck like at 14? I was certainly rebellious. I hated my stepfather. Okay. So I said, I can't wait. So when I was 14, not only I skipped school, I skipped my parents' home, I left the home and moved 50 miles away. At 14? At 14, and I said, I have young kids too. So I'm thinking of that. I said, my son gonna be 14 next year. I said, I don't think I would let him move out, but I just moved out and my mother basically said, you know what, in life you have to make more money than you spend and you will be all right. And that's so, your mom, so you, you listened to your mom's voice. My mom was an angel and my stepfather was a devil. Basically, wow. if you would say, he was totally crazy. I think at that time in the countryside, I grew up in the countryside, you know, they didn't diagnose people. He was totally bipolar. Mm. So he could be really nice, but then he would go off and he used to have a drinking problem. And I mean, he was violent. He got into fights everywhere. I mean, he was crazy. And you avoided, you tried to avoid him as much as possible. I, as much as possible. So when I was 14, I left my home. Yeah. When I was 17, I left the country. I moved to France. You know, a lot of times you sit down with somebody. I don't know if you know Steve Aoki, the DJ. His yeah, mom, I know him so, very well. So you know his similar story to yours. Yeah. His mom was uh, very supportive, loving. You can do everything. But his dad was, you know, founding Benihana, never around. Yeah. Uh, to him, it said in life, business is first, then comes, you know, family. Yeah. Do you think as a boy uh, coming up, 
you, you notice a trend where someone in the family had to be a little bit challenging you, pushing you, like difficult in your life for you to have that kind of an ambition to want to go out and prove a point? You think there's a, a little you bit of that? Know, I don't know if it is part of it too, where if you have a really comfortable life when you're young and everything is prepared for you, you're sent to the right school, you have the right, you have your own room at home and yeah. you have everything, maybe there's less challenges, maybe there's less motivation and maybe you don't achieve. So sometimes I ask myself now, I said, maybe not to say it was a good thing the way my stepfather, sure. but maybe he motivated me more because I remember when I went to France and one day I told him, I won't come home until I get a Mercedes and I'm gonna come and drive it into your living room, <laughs> through the wall. <laughs> and you telling this to, to your stepdad? I told my stepdad and then, you know what happened? Years and years <laughs> later, he came here with my mother so I had to be nice to him because of my mother. So they stayed together. They stayed together. She should have shot him. Would have been a good deed, maybe. <laughs> I told you many times. But then, you know, I said, what am I going to do? I cannot ignore my mother. You know, we only have one mother. So I sent them on cruises. And every year they came here, went on a cruise to South America, to the Caribbean, everywhere, really, they went. So for me, it was really special to really treat my mother really right, but he came along for the ride. Is he still around or no? No. So did, you, did, did your last moments with him, was it good, or was it you, you still to the very end, you were not too fond of him? You know, I wasn't too fond of him. I'm not, the way I speak, I am obviously not too fond of him now, because I really think when you live your life, you cannot really go on and just forgive. You know, I forgave to a point where I said, okay, I tolerate him. Interesting. But I don't gonna say, I wanna be friends or love him. So almost like I'll forgive, but I won't forget what happened. So exactly, that happen again. yeah. Interesting. So I also heard somewhere you said you were working at a restaurant and the head chef or somebody said you'll never amount to anything or something like yeah, that. Exactly. So you had your stepdad, but you also had another person that said in the world. So exactly. Tell, tell so when I was 14, I left my home. Okay. I remember it was like um, in a four, on a four day, it was raining and cloudy and you know, foggy all over. And I took the train to the town. And my father, my stepfather, when I left, he said, he always told me I was good for nothing. So when I, when I left, he said, you're good for nothing. In three weeks, you're going to be back home and ask me for money. And he went on and on. I just went. And I remember my grandmother took me to the train station, which was about an hour walk. We didn't have a car or anything. So I went there and then started to work, obviously, in uh, this hotel in Villach. And then maybe a month into it or so, and the chef was crazy a little bit there too, drunk. You know, in the old time, the chefs used to drink a lot, and he was like this bully guy. On a Sunday, we ran out of potatoes, so no more mashed potatoes, no more potatoes with parsley, which was a big thing in Austria. And then they blamed it on me. I was this 14-year-old kid, not even five foot tall. And then the chef, after lunch, he called me over, and says, you know, you should go back home to your mother. You're too young to do that. You're too little. Uh, your mother should breastfeed you for another year. And maybe you grow up like he was crazy. And then he said, OK, you're out. You're gone. You know, we fire you. And it was probably one of my worst days. So I didn't know what to do. It was like Sunday evening. We had a big river, the drove going through the, the, the town. I went on the bridge where the train goes over. So it was a high bridge. And I said, I'm going to kill myself. I'm going to jump into the water. And I'm not going home for sure. So I stood there and stood there like for maybe an hour. What am I going to do? How am I going to jump? And what will happen after? Do I gonna, mm. I'm thinking, do I going to go to hell or to heaven? And you know, what is it? All after? these thoughts, All these thoughts going through and my mind. How are you 14, 14. At 14, you're thinking about taking your life. Yeah. And then finally, an hour or so into it, I said, OK, you know what? I'm just going to go back tomorrow and see what happened. So I, I went off the bridge, went home, couldn't sleep all night, obviously. Went early in the morning to the like at seven to the hotel restaurant, and then the apprentice who was ahead of me saw me coming back, and he was so happy. He said, "Oh, you're back! Thank God!" So I don't have to peel potatoes and do all that thing for another six months. And then 
he took me and took me down into the vegetable cellar and I was sitting on a, on a crate down there peeling potatoes and carrots and onions and all that stuff. Brought me little sandwiches down. So after about three weeks into that, the chef came down and sees me there. And he says, what are you doing here screaming at me? You, you're fired, why you're still here and this and that. And get out of here. And I said, I'm not leaving. You told him you're not leaving? Yeah, he grabbed me. I says, get out of here. I put my heels in. I says, I'm not leaving. I was this little guy and he was this big bully. Finally, he didn't know what to do. So he called the manager and the owner and they came down and he told them, you know, I don't know what to do with him. He is too little. He is stupid. He doesn't know how to do that. He's too young. Every word possible to make me feel bad and uh, negative. And then the owner was a little nicer. He said, okay, you know what, we'll send you to our other hotel. They had another small hotel in town, and maybe over there it will be better for you. So I said, okay. So they sent me to the other hotel. Over there they had the lady who was a chef, and she said, oh, just be nice, do what we tell you to do, and don't make any waves, just do your job, and everything will be fine. And so it was good, and then I started, everything was good. Every year we went for three months to school. We as who? We as... Uh, all the kids, all okay. the, the apprentices, not all Got together. So it. they had this apprenticeship program where you went for three years and part of it you had to go to the school to learn, you know, more the theoretical stuff and also cooking, the principle of cooking a little bit. So every week we had like three or four afternoons cooking. In the morning you know, we got a little English lessons, math lessons, bookkeeping lessons and so forth. So when I came back then for the first three months, we always had to go to the owner and show him, everybody had to, all the kids had to do that and show him the report card. And I had straight A's. So the owner said, oh my God, it's the first time somebody has straight A's. And he was a very smart guy. He was actually a lawyer by trade. Then each time when he walked into the kitchen, he asked for the chef or said hello to the chef and said, where is Wolfgang? So all of a sudden I became like an important kid in the kitchen and the other kids were almost jealous of me. They said, why is he only asking was that for him? Was that the first time we had somebody that believed in you? With yeah. So your mom. I know your mom is supportive. But. Yeah, my mom was very supportive and somebody doesn't tell me I'm good for nothing. Mm. You know, so all of a sudden my esteem went that's great. Better. You're, you're, what, you're 15, 16 at that time? 15, yeah. 15. So why didn't you jump? You know, looking back, I, you know, I just, all of a sudden it came to my mind. I said, maybe he's going to change his mind. Maybe he was drunk. Maybe, you know, maybe he's going to say, oh, he wants to come back. Okay, I'll try one more time. Maybe let's give him one more try. So all these things, all these different scenarios went through my head when I looked down in the dark. You know, it was like looking down a big dark hole with a river with the eyes, blocks going down and everything. So yeah, there's a video that went viral. They interviewed the 100 uh, people that jumped off of Bay Bridge who they committed suicide. So there's 2000 people that jumped off. Everybody died except for 100, 100 made it, some number like that. And they interviewed them. Okay, what happened after you jumped? And every one of them said, from the moment we let go, there was a regret. So it's amazing how you're saying it because there's a lot of conversation right now about suicide yeah. going around around the world. Well, I'm, you know, I think millions of people around the world are glad you didn't because our appetite is very happy with you. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm happy too. <laughs> yeah, so the, the fact that you did that. Yeah. So, okay, from there you went, so you kind of are going through class, you're getting straight A's. The man who's an attorney, he's kind yeah. of uh, uh, taking a liking into you, he's liking you. So what happens next from there? So then in the third year when I was 16 or 17 like that, we had this restaurant from France come to cook for one week their food from Burgundy, from Dijon. Mm -hmm. It's a restaurant called Trois Faisons. And they came and I looked the way they cooked, like they made chicken in red wine sauce, coco vin they call it, or boeuf bourguignon, or they made pâtés. They used wine, like bottles of wine and reduced it and simmered the chicken. And they brought snails, like we didn't have snails in Austria. And so I said, I want to go to France. So I wrote them a note, you know, I would like to come and practice there for a year or so as a stagiaire, and they accepted me. So I went there with the train, it took like a day and a half. How, how old are you at 17. 17. Yeah. About a year into it, the owner and chef of the restaurant in Dijon, that's a party for the staff. I spoke French already at that time, so a little bit at least. And then the party was because we got a star in the Guide Michelin. And I had no idea at that time about the Guide Michelin. So I 
took one book and we got one star. So and everybody said, oh, now we are like one of the top restaurants in France or the top restaurant, the way they were talking. And then I take the book and I said, oh my God, there are two star restaurants and three star restaurants. So then I said, before going back to Austria, I want to work in a three star restaurant. And then I wrote to Bocuse and Trois Gros and La Serre and all the famous restaurants. And the first one who responded positive was Raymond Tullier at Beaumanier in south of France, near Marseille. Three stars. Three stars, yeah. There's not that many three stars around no, the at, world. No, at, yes. at that time there were 12. 12 oh. three stars around the world? Yeah, they didn't have it international, it was only France. Got it. And then they went to Germany, Italy, France, and so on to Spain and you America, guess. everywhere now, yeah. I started there and over there the owner and chef was 72 years old, but he was so passionate about food, about the products. And I still remember as a kid there, and he used to bring, Picasso used to come to the restaurant, he used to walk with Picasso into the kitchen. Picasso was a little guy, he was big, walked him around. You Picasso? Yeah. You served Picasso, you, you yeah. served Picasso? Yeah. We had the Queen of England came. Wow. We had, like at that time, Elizabeth Taylor came and Richard Burton. I remember I was there years into it. One day, Peter O'Toole, a famous actor from England, he used to film there somewhere. And uh, my friend was a waiter and he was sitting by himself drinking. And then I had a little motorbike. I had to drive him to the part of the hotel on my motorbike, which was a small, ho a small house, like a dependence house. And he was hanging on to me and I was driving him <laughs> to his room, <laughs> to wow. his hotel. So it was an interesting thing. And that's when I really said, I want to do that for a living. I said, I want to be like Raymond Tullier. So until that moment, you hadn't, you hadn't decided yet. I haven't decided. You're doing it because your mom does it. Yeah, I, because yeah. my mom, and I wanted to get away from my stepfather. And then I, at that time, I had a friend who was a truck driver. And he used to drive from Trieste in Italy to Vienna. And he made a lot of money. I mean, for me at that time, you know, I made maybe, I don't know, 500 uh, shilling at that time a month, and he made 5,000. That's a lot of money. I know, for a kid, five, with 5,000 shilling, I could buy a car or a nice motorbike and go skiing. I didn't have to walk up the mountain. I could take the lift and everything, go out with the girl and everything. So. I wasn't sure, but then, but then Tulia became my mentor. And I think when I was 19, really it, it changed my life. And I was cooking next to him. So he was making all the sauces and everything. And somehow he took a liking on me because I wasn't scared of him. And like when he made something or I made something, he tasted it and said, okay, put a little salt, put a little pepper, put a little lemon juice, whatever it is in the sauce. And then uh, I said, okay, I put the things in. And then when he made something, he said, taste it. I tasted it and said, oh, maybe a little salt and pepper, maybe a little this. And he looked at me, okay, <laughs> he didn't say it. So he took counsel from you? Yeah, and I was like 19 years old. Wow. As a matter of fact, then... Did that kind of give you confidence? Oh, totally. Somebody like him listens to you? Yeah, totally. And I, everybody else, when he made something, they tasted it and said, oh, it's delicious. You know, oh, it's very good. You know, nobody would tell him a little more this or a little more that except me. And I thought, no big deal, you know. Was he crazy? Was he the typical chef that... He was you know, a, he has multiple personalities. Yeah, no, chef. he had a, a passion. At 72, he was 72 years old. He was so passionate. So he had this huge gardens with six gardeners providing all the ingredients we used in the kitchen like we get the tiniest string beans the best strawberries or the best melons and things like that made in the garden made six gardens in, that he had with the six gardeners in his gardens, gardens at, garden. yeah wow he had olive orchards so we used to go in november when it wasn't busy we picked the olive trees shook the olive trees with a big tablecloth underneath and picked up all the olives and made olive oil and everything so to me it was really the beginning where I said, wow, this guy is amazing. He's 72 years old. And he actually was so nice to me. And like one day when he went on vacation, I still remember, he told the chef, who was at that time maybe 40 years old or so, he said, I'm leaving for a week, but Wolfgang has to stay here and do the sauces and uh, make sure he doesn't take a day off. Yeah, he so made the sauce close to the way he was making the yeah, sauce. Yeah, and he gave me all this confidence then. And uh, so I think he changed really my life. That's powerful, right? And you know, the funniest thing is talking about Iran. So when I was there, Maxime's in Paris and Beaumanier did the, the 2000 anniversary of the 
imperial. 1972 or 74, something. Yeah, like somewhere that. around yes. there. Yeah, and I was supposed to go, and I forgot I didn't have a passport <laughs> because you I was supposed to go to the 2500 year celebration in Iran. Yeah, so. totally. And they went, Bomania went, Maxims went, and you know Everybody. they. I mean, that was like the party to go to. I know it was an amazing thing without in in uh, Persepolis. Persepolis. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and you remember that? Yeah, totally, totally. And then I go, and they said to you, like two days before, I said, okay, you have, need your passport. They want to know your passport. <laughs> you and I said, passport. shit, I don't have my passport. <laughs> I lost it. I don't know what happened. Wow. So, so how many years did you work under him? How many years? Two and a half years, so, almost three years. Got it. And really then, like I was 20 years old. He had another restaurant here, the three-star restaurant and the one-star restaurant. He fired the chef in the one-star restaurant and put me there for a year as the chef in the one-star restaurant. I was 20 years old. I had five French guys with me. They were my cooks and they were all older than me. So it was tough for me to order them around because they said, who is this Austrian? You know, we are the French, you know, we know about food, we are much better. But he really trusted me and that really changed my life, you know, and gave me confidence. And, and I don't know, so somehow it took me to the next level. So, so what do you do next after that? So you have after this experience, that, are you so kind then, of getting confidence? Uh, in confident, it? yeah. So then I went to work at, in Monaco at L'Hôtel de Paris and I didn't like it there because it was so structured but it was boring in comparison to Beaumanier. Was it also Michelin one star? Anything? Yeah, maybe one star or okay. two star, but very formal, not individual, you know, was everything like the books, you know, like, like Escoffier style. Yeah. And then I went to see Mr. Tullier and I said, you know, I don't know what to do. I want to go somewhere else if he can help me. So he said, okay, I'm going to Paris and I'm going to see Mr. Bodabel, the owner of Maxim's, which was a three-star restaurant, and maybe they find your job there. And he did. So I started to work at Maxim's in Paris. So and you have experience from two three-star restaurants yeah. you worked at. How different was the one in Paris than the one you worked at in... Uh... Well, Beaumanier was mainly the owner and chef. I said, I want to be like him. I want to own my own restaurant. I want to own my own destiny. I don't want to go to somebody to ask for a raise. So you modeled your career after him? After him. Okay. And then how was the one in, uh, in Paris? In Paris was start? very good. I loved it because it was a very upscale French restaurant. Again, Everybody, the whole world used to go to Maxim's in Paris. I remember like Onassis was a regular, Salvador Onassis. Dali, and all these people used to come, all the actors. I, I saw Charlie Chaplin there waiting outside for his limousine. And so it was an amazing experience. So the Kennedys used to come, the whole clan used to come. And Maxim's was the place to go. I mean, the, I remember Shizka Destin was the finance uh, minister at that time. He used to have lunch there every day because Rui Riboli, which is the minister of finance there, they were not far away. So it was a great experience too. But the cooking or what inspired me was Mr. Tullier at Beaumanier. Still. Still, I said, I want to be like him. Not like the chef at Maxim's, who was very good, but he worked for somebody. Got so it. to me at that time, I said, I want to create my own destiny. So I want to say correctly, Bohemier? Bomanier. Bomanier. Bomanier is B-A-U-M-A-N-I-E-R-E. -E. So Bomanier, you work with him, and then you work the, the, the place in France. Yeah. At this point, are you making money yet, or you're not making No. Oh, okay. So you're not making money yet. Bomanier, I didn't make much money. L'Hôtel de Paris, I didn't make much money. At Maxime's, the last six months, the night chef, because Maxime was open late after theater and everything. So mm -hmm. we had a lot of people coming after the opera. And like at that time, like Maria Callas used to sing and so forth. So. Then he used to come and uh, the night chef who was responsible for the kitchen left to open his own restaurant. And then the chef told me, oh, you're going to be the, the chef now at night with five chefs in a three-star restaurant. And I said, okay. And there is the first time I made money. So I bought a car. I remember I bought an Alfa Romeo from one Alfa of the Romeo. waiters. Wow. Yeah, and that was like Alfa a shake Romeo car. Like, uh, when I went to a club or, you know, to a disco at that time, and the girl saw me driving an Alfa and said, okay. Alfa Romeo know. was a racing car in Europe. It's a yeah, really a well sports race. car. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. In America, not really. In Europe, no. it is. In Europe, it was big. At that time. Good, yeah. 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 So you have an Alfa Romeo, you're making a little bit of money. Yeah. So what, what happens next for you to say, I want to come? What You seem like you're a person who modeled. You seem like you're somebody that's extremely driven because of what happened with your stepdad and you wanted to prove a point. You had somebody who loved you, which is your mom. And then you modeled somebody who believed in you, Beaumanier. 
But then after that, what was the inspiration to say I'm coming to America? So when I worked at Maxim's in Paris, they op Maxim's opened the restaurant in Chicago. And Maxim's in Chicago. Got it. And the pastry chef, who I became good friends with, opened the restaurant in Chicago with Maxim's. Mm -hmm. And then he came back to France after a year or two years, worked again at the, hot at the restaurant in Paris, at Maxim's in Paris. And he and me became very friendly and hung out and everything. And then he said, you are young. And obviously I watched all these cowboy movies. I watched movies where they all drive this big Chevrolet and Cadillacs and everything. I said, everybody is rich in America. I want to go to America. And then I left Maxim's. The chef said, okay, if you don't come back in the next two months, I give your job to somebody else. But I, I will wait because I really like you. And I went. And then I didn't like New York. I didn't like the restaurant. It was called La Goulou, where I was supposed to work. You didn't like New York as a city, or as you didn't a city, like your experience with the restaurant. And they both. I don't know. I, you just didn't connect with it. I didn't know where to go. Like I remember, I arrived at the airport, and the taxi asked me where I want to go, and I said I want to go to New York City. And he said, but where? I said, well, to a hotel around the Empire State Building because I knew the Empire State Building. And then he dropped me off in a cheap hotel, and he probably saw a young kid like that. And I remember with a coke cockroaches all over and everything was terrible. And then the restaurant I was supposed to work was like a bistro. And I said, I worked in all these three-star mm -hmm. restaurants. This yeah. is not the cooking I love, you know, that way. And there's nothing wrong with the bistro, obviously, but it, I was young. I said, I want to play at this level, not at this level. Mm -hmm. And so then through a friend there, they found me a job in Indianapolis. And I got so excited because... All the cities in yeah, Indianapolis. But I am... Still, but I was always a fan of auto racing. So like for me, Formula One was like the top sport. Yes. And the Indy 500 is the top of course, in race the in the world, maybe at that time for sure. So what year was that? Is that still in the 70s or we Yeah, in the 70s, in the, the 70s. In the mid okay. in 74. 74, so, eight years before Spago gets started. Yeah, okay. so then I worked in Indianapolis for a year, then came to Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. I started to work in a restaurant called Ma Maison, which I had no idea at that time how bad it was or whatever. I quit my job and then started to work there and my first paycheck bounced. I said, what the heck? I never had that happen in my life. So I went to the owner, Patrick Deray, who is his uncle owned La Tour Argent in Paris. And I said, well, what are I going to do? They said, there's no money in the bank. And, you know, they only did like 30 lunches and maybe that many dinners. He said, well, and then we worked out a deal where I became a part owner. And he said, so that way you get uh, some upside if the restaurant does well. Sure enough, the restaurant started to get better and better. We got more and more customers coming. And I remember at one point, Gourmet Magazine called up and says, oh, we went to the restaurant, the critic, he wanted some information. And so we talked and said, oh my God, I had this caramel ice cream, it was amazing. I had this fish and puff pastry, as good as at Paul Bocuse in Lyon. And so on. they went on and on. And they wrote this amazing review. And then I told Patrick, I said, I don't know what we're going to do. It's just we started to get busy in the restaurant with a lot of locals, mm -hmm. people like Orson Welles used to come every day for lunch. I used to sit with him, talk with him. I said, now I'm not going to be able to serve them anymore because everybody from all over the country is going to know we have this restaurant. So we decided to take out the listing in the phone book. You know, there was no cell phones at that time and everything. Why? Because so we don't, we only get the people who know us can come and the other ones not. Was to like keep a, it elite. To keep it elite. But now, when we, you did that, did you raise prices? Or no, did, nothing. You kept it the same. We kept everything the same. I was just so concerned. I said, we have to serve our customers. We have. So that way they can get a table. That way we can serve them. I still had a very small yeah. kitchen. Yeah. And so I said, we cannot go, instead of serving 80 dinners, all of a sudden serve 150. It would be impossible. So that's what happened. So we took that out. Then the next thing is People Magazine wrote this huge article about how snobby, how chic, everything a Mamaison is. They even have an unlisted telephone number. So then, for sh and they say, and, and they said, <laughs> by, by, by the way, that is the number. That makes everybody want to go. And totally. So, so that, and they published a the number. People Magazine published a number. So then we had to put a private number for our regular guests. They yes. got the private number because got the it. phone rang off the hook. And then I built a bigger kitchen. But then I still said, you know what? I'm a part owner. Instead of having confidence in me, like for example, when he went on vacation, he told the maitre d' 
to sign the checks, not me. And I said, he's crazy. The maitre comes to work. I produce for 65 or 70 percent of the income of the restaurant because I'm the chef. I decide if we make money or not, basically. And then he has this guy who is a nice guy, but signed the checks instead of me. So I got really pissed off. And then I said, you know, I don't think that's going to work out in the long term. But I still felt in a way guilty a little bit to leave. So I stayed on and then one day I found this new location on Sunset and I went to Patrick and I said, you know, I found this location, but we have to change the way we operate. We have to create a restaurant company, an operating company. We're gonna run the restaurants, but we have to be 50-50 partner. Not that I own 10% and you own 50%, you know. He says, no, I always gonna own 51%. Well, then I said, well, that me too. Got it. So then, we left, I had to leave. What year is that? That's then in uh, 81. Okay, and you, you left? In 81. 81. Yeah, so I stayed there for six years. I built up my maison from $18,000 business a month to $300,000 a month. That's, that's, that's a lot of And that was in, yeah, in the 70s, so. Wow. So it, we all of Did us- Did you become a one star, two star, was there a Michelin? No, there was no Michelin, but we were of the top three restaurants in the city and, you know, everybody used to come to the restaurant. I used to cook for all the big movie people and uh, record I mean, you people. Everybody. Yeah, you, you, totally, you, you, totally. You probably had dinner, wine, drinks, food, yeah. whatever about it. Uh-huh. So then you come out here. Then, so that, so that was here in LA. Okay. And then I found this location. And because Patrick didn't want to be 50-50 partner, I had to leave. This location? Then first location sunset. up on Sunset. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So then in 82, in January, I opened Spargo. So Spargo was the first restaurant with an open kitchen. I built the open kitchen. I said, I want to manage the whole restaurant. I want to see the customers. I want to see how everything works. You were the first open kitchen? Yeah. Owner? Of right. any upscale restaurant, yeah. Wow. And now it's it's very customary. Uh, it's everybody very has it now, open yeah. Kitchen, yes. We were the first one like here in LA and, uh, to have a wood burning oven, a wood burning grill and everything. So we cooked everything over live fire. And I think but the open kitchen really was this thing all of a sudden. Then I thought I'm gonna have this neighborhood restaurant, you know, up on Sunset Pool while you had the houses up in yeah. the hills and everything. And it became this instant success. I remember three weeks into it, Billy Wilder, who was a famous movie director and also Austrian like me, brought in Sidney Poitier and Chuck Lemon and John Collins. So they were all sitting on one big table and somebody from the newspaper or whatever was there too. And they said, oh, Spargo is the place to go now. Everybody somehow had to go to Spargo. We became this really amazingly busy restaurant. Then I talked Swifty Lazar, who was like an agent, into doing the Oscar party there. So. We were parked every night. And the funny thing was because you had the front of the restaurant where all the VIP were sitting, and then the back, which was Siberia. And people used to get pissed off and said, ah, you son of a bitch, you <laughs> sent me over in Siberia again. <laughs> I said, no, the food is the same. Everything is the same. So let me ask you, that there's a, there's a part, obviously you're very charming. You're very charismatic. You're very attractive. Your personality is very, very attractive. You, you, you think that kind of helped you when it comes, because it looks like, you have the creative side, you have that part about it, you creating, but also the, the other element of convincing Oscars to want to, you know, do the governor's ball. How many years has it been that you've done? I mean, well, we're doing the governor's ball now for the 25th year already. 25th year already? Yeah. That's craziness to be able to say 25th 25 year. So yeah, did that's... you call them and you said, I want to... No. They came to me and asked me, why you don't do our governor's board, the board of governors. Who so is they? Who is the, they? the board of governors, the people who put on the Oscars. They contact They them. have a board of governors. So like I remember at that time, Arthur Heller, who was a famous director, you know, who did Love Story and many other movies. Yes, Love Story, Alan, a beautiful movie. Yeah, and Alan and Marilyn Bergman, who did all the songs for Barbara Streisand, were on the board. And they used to come to Spargo one day and says, you know, we really would like you to cater the dinner. And I said, okay. I'm going to try and see. So when I did the first dinner after the awards, it was at the Shrine Auditorium. I still remember like yesterday. And normally they had nobody going to the dinner. They all came to the party at Spargo. So the restaurant, the whole room was full. Everybody stayed for dinner and everybody ate. Wow. And I remember Mike Owitz came with Paul Newman and uh, Robert Redford and all the people and I walked These around. Like the names, the big, the big, the big time, yeah, big time, guys. That was, uh, 
you know, in 1995 or 94 or something like that, you know. So I think then after that now, everybody goes to the governor's ball. Whereas before it was always nothing, you know, nobody went. I remember when we were at Spargo watching the Academy Awards with Swifty and his party. And then some TV crew was over there at the Beverly Hilton where they had the governor's ball and it was empty. And some of them went there with their Oscars, said hello and walked out and came to came us. to you. Yeah. That's the part about you that there has to be people wanting to help contribute to your success. Like there's got to be an element of likability, like yeah. being with people. So how much of your business world on what you think about, how much of your business is it the food? Is it the recipes? Is it what you do in the kitchen? And how much of it is the service you provide me as a person that's coming to you? Because there's some, some level of loyalty for service as well. How we interact with the customer, how we make them feel. So sure, we have to make great food. We have to give good service, but we are in the hospitality business. We want to make people feel good. We want to make people feel happy when they come to a restaurant. We want to make people feel that when they leave, they're going to make a reservation or they're going to think, oh, I'm going to come back as soon as I can. You know the nightclub business, a nightclub runs for like five to ten years in the 90s. Dublin's, you know, you had all these things and then they die out. And yeah. the next one comes out, Garden of Eden, and then that the Central Club, it dies out. And so nightclub is almost like a cyclical cycle of five to ten. Yeah. It's very similar to restaurants though, right? 36 years is a long time. And now you're in Vegas, you're in Istanbul with Spago, I'm not even yeah. talking cut. Yeah. You, you have it all these other places. How did you manage it to keep staying attractive for the customers to want to keep coming back? Because traditions change, generations change. Yeah. So generationally you've done Boomer, Gen X, Millennial. And now, how, do, how are you doing that? You know, it's an interesting experience because when I tell people that all these guests, for example, if it was Tony Curtis, Chuck Lemon, Orson Wells, Elizabeth Taylor, whoever, they're all dead now. That's a different tradition. It's a, a totally different, different generation. If we stay the same, it's very difficult because then the younger people don't want to come. But if you change too much, you lose all your base clientele. So then you're in trouble too. Then you have to gain a complete new one. So we have people who come here. That's a powerful point you just made right there because sometimes so many entrepreneurs are so concerned about only getting the new customers, they forget to keep the, the old existing one. loyal customers. The, they have very good point. Yeah, that's how a lot of restaurants stay in business two years or even less or a little more because I think you have to get a really good base clientele. You have to have people who come and become repeat customers. You know, it's very expensive always to get new customers in any business. Mm -hmm. It's much cheaper to keep the old ones. Well, well, first of all, this has been a pleasure just listening to you and your story. Uh, obviously, I know who you are, I know what you've done, I know all that, but I didn't know the deeper side of the story. And for you to open up and kind of share with the rest of us, it's yeah. obvious why uh, you are who you are right now. It's an inspiration to a lot of people out there. Well, I hope so, and I hope, you know, that people really think that it doesn't, it wasn't always like that. You know, there's always difficulty. There's always somebody who's trying to put something in your rod, you know, put something against you, make you feel bad. But patience and tenacity are an important part. Now, if you're lucky like me and you find your passion, then life is easy. Then you don't have to go in the morning and say, oh, I have to go to work again. You get up in the morning, like I went yesterday to the fish market. Do I have to go to the fish market? No, but I love to, I did that for years and years and years, like when I went to the fish market, to the flower market, I still love to be involved in it because food and the customers are really my passion. And that's why customers like me keep coming back. And we keep coming back because it's important that the man at the top is still in the game yeah. and you still love the game. So yeah. uh, 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 for those watching, what I want you to do is I want you to tweet him at the handle that's here. And he's on Twitter, right? Is he active on Twitter? Send him a tweet at the handle here and mine here. Let us know what you took away from today's episode. And if you haven't subscribed, click on the subscribe button. Wolfgang Puck, thank so you so much. So good to have you. Thank you. Thank you. My thank pleasure. You.